Hey everyone, I want to talk to you today about what it means to uh, achieve exponential growth. I know that for, the, uh, yeah, for most of the day you've talked a little bit more conceptually about things. I'm here to kind of bring it down and make it more uh, hands-on. Um, connecting the dots, that's my name. A formula for exponential growth. That's what we're going to talk about. And you can't uh, really uh, give a talk like this without introducing myself. So uh, when I was 20 years old, I started my first company, Wakupa, that got acquired by GFK. I moved to New York afterwards, started this company called Karma. Um, and uh, that did really well. And because it was doing well, Google approached me and said, hey, uh, we are working on a new product. Do you want to come run it? And do you want to uh, explore that with us? So I did spend about uh, two and a half years living in Silicon Valley. Um, and now I'm back to uh, be the managing director of uh, TQ, which is a, a tech hub that we're building in the heart of Amsterdam um, that will launch somewhere in uh, September. So please come by if, uh, if you can. Um, I want to start off this talk by talking about something that isn't really talked about much, which is constraints. Um, you can't talk about growing without talking about the opposite. And often people think about it like this. Constraints are things you can't do, and that is the opposite of what you need to do to grow your company, grow yourself, grow your network, whatever. Um, but that's actually not true. Uh, constraints are what make you grow. And this might sound a little bit uh, counterintuitive, but I'll give you an example. Uh, when we were building my first company, um, my uh, co-founder and CTO came up to me and said, hey, we have this really big problem. We need more, more servers because, um, you know, we're just, uh, we are, have so many users right now and it's really hard to, uh, to yeah, uh, uh, give them, uh, serve up the site. And my uh, reaction to that was, well, too bad because we're out of money. Um, so what do you do uh, right then in that situation, right? You have this constraint of not having the budget to buy these additional servers. And my co-founder said, you know what? I'll give it another shot and I'll optimize the product that we have. I'll optimize the code base and then possibly we can still uh, manage. So over the course of the weekend, he rebuilt the entire app almost from scratch. And at that point, we could run on that one server that we had. We didn't have to buy a new one. And in fact, for the coming three months, we didn't have to buy a new server. But this other thing happened as well, which is that we were able to develop our offering way faster. Um, that because this code base was cleaned up, it was nice, it was ready for growth. And that's something you'll see um, in a lot of different areas as well. It's not just in technology, but it can be in, in marketing, it can be in sales. You should try and look for those constraints. The things that hold you back are actually a really great opportunity for yourself to say, this is how I will re, um, rediscover myself and uh, achieve this exponential growth. And so uh, I want to talk to you about what, uh, what it takes to get there, what it takes to get from that constraint to that exponential growth. And I think it really uh, is about two, um, two main topics, excellence and distribution. Excellence part, uh, we're going to talk about first. So excellence in itself, what does that mean? Uh, it means that in some way or another, you are going from a really terrible product to a really excellent product. Um, this is something that you know a lot of people uh, leave out of the discussion when they talk about growth hacking or growth marketing. No one ever talks about excellence. And at Google, we had the same issue when I came in. Um, so at Google, there was a team called Product Excellence, and they said, we're going to make our products not uh, OK, not good, but really, really excellent. And you do that through um, a few different uh, channels. Your first channel to make things really excellent, to make them really, really work, is, is talent. The team that you have assembled. And how do you make that team uh, work for you. Um, you do that, first of all, by not putting them in, uh, in, in little cubes and kind of like sectioning them off from each other. No, you do it by uh, making this uh, concept called project teams. So a platform team uh, in your company is when you would have Android engineers, iOS engineers, uh, UX designers, visual designers, uh, sales managers, business developers, marketeers, and everyone kind of has their own structure, their own to-dos, and no one really communicates. But a project team is, for instance, hey, here's a team that is about onboarding new customers. 
Here's a team that's, uh, that's all about the marketing website. And those teams consist of very diverse peoples, of diverse, uh, div diverse um, skills. And so, you know, you would have, for instance, in a team that is about onboarding, you would have uh, a designer, an iOS engineer, an Android engineer, a data scientist, etc. So, you know, when you think about a company like Google, um, you probably have this really romanticized image of, of that happening, but uh, over the course of the last year, Google has reinvented themselves, themselves by looking at product excellence, and this was one of the main uh, keys, is to go from an engineering uh, talent uh, culture, where everything is about engineering, to a more mixed culture of designers, to working together with engineers, working together with the sales team to really um, create something amazing. It's something excellent, I should say. But this only really works if you apply the following advice. Strong opinions, weakly held. What does that mean? It is okay to be very passionate about something. If you're really, really passionate about uh, the solution that you found, it is okay to cry for it, to fight for it. That is totally fine. But you should always be open for someone else's strong opinion. And when uh, you are convinced that this is uh, the right way to go, you should leave your passion uh, for that other idea to the wayside. Um, so check out uh, Paul Sappho's uh, site uh, for more about this. But I thought it would, yeah, it really helped me in uh, developing a different type of culture when you think about creating a company and creating a culture at your company of excellence. You should be able to argue with people. It is okay to argue, but if someone has the true right solution with the right amount of information to back it up, don't get stuck on your island. Don't, you know, just try and get your way across. This other thing that we uh, at Google uh, really, really focused on is the prototyping process. And one of the examples of that is, for instance, the Google Design Sprint. Who here knows what that is? All right, that's, uh, that's some, uh, some people, that's great. Uh, the Google Design Sprint is essentially a way for you to validate this idea that you have in a group together with different disciplines. It is essentially a, a week, a week of prototyping. So on the first day, you really start out by saying, what is it we're trying to solve? Really understand the problem that you're trying to solve. Then you kind of split up as a team and you say, okay, well, um, what can we, how can we solve this problem? What are the small ideas that we have? And on the third day, you're gonna decide on one of these ideas. You're gonna say, this is how we're gonna develop um, a solution. Um, eventually, you'll end up prototyping that. And on the first day, you've also hired actual users to come in for the fifth day. So you go on Craigslist or Markplatz or whatever, and you say, here's a Starbucks uh, gift card if you come to my office and try the shitty thing that I'm gonna make. Uh, you don't say the shitty part, but you know, let's try out uh, the, this app idea that I have and give me your feedback. Um, and basically, uh, this is a really, really great way for your team to together reach a, 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 a consensus and, and make something amazing uh, with all the stakeholders in one room. Um, the other part of it is that you have to measure what you have built. And there's a few ways of doing that, but one of the uh, really cool ways is the Heart Framework, uh, which is uh, an initiative by, um, by Google Ventures. Um, so basically what uh, the Heart Framework is trying to do is it's trying to map out what things should we measure in our app. And it does that over the course of those five uh, uh, things on that whiteboard right there uh, to the left. So happiness engagement, adoption, retention, and tax, uh, task success. And for each of those uh, categories, you can take a look at what are the goals we're trying to achieve when it comes to uh, happiness, for instance. Well, the goal is that more people, when they uh, have used my app, that uh, more than 90% uh, said that it was a delightful experience. And so what is the signal from that? Well, that you can measure that also by, for instance, the amount of uh, referrals that they've made. So the amount of other people they told about your app. And then finally, that uh, derives to uh, a metric. So you could say, okay, well, the uh, referral rate for people is 70%. And that, that's what we're gonna hit. And so as you map these out, for each of those five disciplines in the word heart, um, you'll know whether or not this is something uh, you can measure. And from that, you derive this one thing called a hero metric. Uh, a hero metric is the one single thing that your whole team should care about. It doesn't matter if you're in sales, doesn't matter if you're a designer. Um, this is what you should like, breathe and think about and dream about every single day. What is the one metric that I'm gonna make better at the end of the month. 
Um, so for instance, you know, you could think about if you have a photo sharing app, then it's the amount of shares and if um, the amount of shared photos. But if uh, an engineer is working to uh, allow someone to upload more photos, is that supporting that goal? Or could the engineer be working on this sharing functionality so that you know, that is a way easier to do? Um, this is a way for you to prioritize. This is a way for you to prioritize together with your team and to have a single vision forward, which is really important if you want to create excellent products. Um, another way of kind of measuring your progress is called OKRs. Who has heard of OKRs? All right, one person, no, no, a few more, great. Uh, yeah, OKRs are objectives and key results, and it kind of looks like this. So this is a sheet that you make, um, and this is just an example, but this is a sheet uh, that you make to, um, uh, in this case, improve uh, the reputation of, of Blogger as a blogging tool. And this particular person has said, the objective is the reputation of Blogger should be better. It's pretty broad, right? There's nothing substantial about that. But where it does get substantial is in the key results. So for instance, there's this thing saying, there's a 10th birthday coming up from, uh, for Blogger, and I'm going to coordinate the PR efforts. Or um, we're going to reestablish the leadership by speaking at three events. You measure the outcomes of these on a scale of, uh, of, of 0 to 1.0. And you do that, for instance, let's say that, um, let's take the first key result, uh, three industry events. Let's say that I would have spoken at only one event, um, then it would be about uh, 0.3. Uh, that would be my score. But this person has spoken at all three events, so he gets a one. The object of this whole thing is not to always get one for each and every thing. No, it's to always land uh, on about 0.6 to 0.7. Why? Because if you have one, then you haven't aimed high enough. You could have, you know, it was too easy almost. And if you've hit four, then you have taken too much work on your plate. So this is a way for you to kind of prioritize what can I achieve within a certain time period, for instance, a three month uh, time period, which is pretty standard. You make quarterly OKRs, quarterly goals. And um, yeah, it's a great way to communicate to others as well what your priority is. So if I go to someone and I say, what are your OKRs this month? Oh, yeah, I'm doing this. I'm helping uh, 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 coordinate the PR efforts for the birthday. Then someone will go like, OK, well, you know, I have this other thing that is uh, maybe important, but let's maybe you know, put that in your OKRs for the next quarter. So you have a lot of transparency about what your team is doing. And this might not really work if your startup is only a few people, obviously. But it, it definitely really, really helps as you're growing. I wanted to talk about priorities really briefly as well, and mainly in a way that I like to talk about it, which is data, demand, and the light. So if you're trying to prioritize anything, right, like should we build this feature, should I hire this person, um, um, should I make this partnership happen so that I can, you know, like grow through that partnership, think about these three things. Um, you can kind of map them out like this three, in 3D, right, and it's about 3Ds. Um, the data part is where you have proof in data that something works. And if you have that proof, if analytics shows that this thing will make your homepage, and you've tested it, this thing will make your homepage convert better, then you know, that's data. And if um, a lot of people outside of the company are saying, yeah, I, uh, I want to learn more about this company, or I want this certain feature really, really badly, or even you know, your CEO is saying, I want this to happen, that is a demand factor that plays in. But the last thing that I think a lot of people forget is the delightfulness factor, the thing that happens that makes you love something, not just like it. Um, so it's a sort of a magical factor. And what you often see is that if, there are, if there's only one of these three reasons why you're making something a priority, you probably haven't thought hard enough about why it's a priority. So this is a good check for yourself. Why are we doing this? Well, it's because the analytics said so. Is there demand? No. Is there a delightful factor? Not really. Maybe it's not a good priority. But if there's two, that's actually really good. And if there's three, you hit a fucking product unicorn. Uh, that doesn't really happen in my experience. Usually it's when uh, you, hit, you think you hit three, but you've actually only hit two or one. Uh, so this is something you know, in your team as well that you could say, if you're going to bring something to the table, if you're going to give me a priority, Give me one of these three things. Give me, you know, why should I make this a priority? On, on what basis? Uh, that's, that's, I think, really important in communicating with your team. Oh, so, so, okay, so quickly, we're going to go into the next uh, phase, after excellence. 
If you have ever made a pitch deck for your company, this looks pretty normal, right? This is what the slides should say. You should uh, explain your problem, your solution, then you should say how much your competitors suck, uh, then your technology and how it's superior, here's the people that do it, give us your money, thank you, bye. Yeah, this is the worst thing you could send me as a pitch deck because you're missing one thing, and that's distribution. How are you gonna get customers? Um, and this is something you should think about in, in kind of like uh, the same platform and the same uh, pillar as excellence. Things need to be excellent, otherwise you can't distribute them. If things are just excellent, then no one will hear about it unless you distribute it. Um, so the best way I found to distribute a product is to have inherent distribution channels in your product. So for instance, uh, with Karma, which was my second company, we made a mobile hotspot that you can put in your pocket and it me meant you had Wi-Fi throughout the US. And the cool thing about a Wi-Fi signal is that inherently it's social because everyone could see it, right? Like you can open up your iPhone right now and you would see your Wi-Fi signal. Um, we use that as a channel to acquire other, uh, other people. So if someone would connect to the, uh, to the, to the Wi-Fi hotspot, and it wouldn't be a Karma member yet. They would get a little pop-up saying, would you want to log in? You know, we'll give you a few hundred megabytes for free of data. You can just use it whenever. And then afterwards, as they had logged in, we sent them an email saying like, hey, you should also maybe uh, buy your own Karma hotspot because it's really cool, et cetera. Um, the cool thing was that our network provider, Sprint, as we were doing this, they actually uh, came back to us and said, hey, uh, guys, we found an error in your system. You have more users than devices. And we're like, that's the point. And we want more users out there. We want to distribute the Wi-Fi signal and have more users that way and then sell them a device. And this was, you know, this might sound pretty obvious, but for a big uh, telecom company, it, it wasn't. Um, the other way of looking at distribution is looking at channels where there is significant stress. And this is something that, for instance, the search team at Google um, has done. Um, they looked at the behavior of people, um, of what they do every day, and they looked at things that had a really, really high urgency and a really, really low success rate. So you could think about, for instance, when, uh, when software fails you, when, you have, when you're trying to get work done, and uh, this work is really urgent, but the software is failing. Uh, then you go online and you search for uh, whatever uh, query you can, at, you know, from the error uh, message. Um, this is also how you can look at uh, your product. You can take a, a look at like, okay, well, are there situations that are stressful for people where they really, really, really need to fulfill this genuine need that they have, but the success rate is incredibly poor. Those are channels where oftentimes you can get really high conversion, you can really, really get your distribution going there. All right, so one of the things of distribution as well is that you want distribution that is, is continuous, that is retained, right? And you do that by creating habits using the hook model. This is from uh, Nir Eyal. Uh, he wrote a really great book about this as well. Basically what it describes is something co uh, called the IKEA effect. And the IKEA effect is when you buy a Schmirgesberg or something and you uh, assemble it yourself. And then every time you walk past the cabinet, you're like, well, it's a piece of shit, but I assembled it. Uh, that's mine. Like, you know, I did something with that. And that's because I made an investment. I made an investment of my, t not just my money, but also my time. I had a trigger from IKEA, maybe it was an ad, maybe something. I took an action to drive to IKEA. Uh, because I uh, arrived at IKEA, things were really neatly uh, designed for me. I got a cup of coffee. Everything was uh, incredibly uh, rewarding. And as I went home, I assembled it and I invested my time into it. And this is something you could see, for instance, in Pinterest as well. Pinterest gets better when you pin more things to it, right? Like you, you pin more things on your board. Um, but there's also variable rewards that Pinterest gives me. If I do certain actions, Pinterest will say, well, we're gonna feature this pin of yours and it's, you know, uh, it's, it's a featured thing right now. Or even with Instagram, if you, you know, if you post a lot of Instagram pictures and they're really, really valuable, then maybe you get features on the Instagram account. This variable reward is really crucial in this hook model. Is if people do really great things with your product, you should reward them more than just doing something very simple. And ultimately, once they have done that enough, uh, you, they can't unhook from your, from your uh, product anymore. Um, like for instance, you know, all my files are on Dropbox right now. 
um, it's really hard for me to take all those files and put them somewhere else. Um, so this is kind of what you want to look at if you want to create real habits with people. In general, this is something we uh, tell startups that um, you know, are looking for residents at TQ, at the Tech Hub as well, is that we say you would want to achieve 5 to 7% growth weekly. Uh, this is not something that we came up with. It's actually something that Y Combinator came up with, uh, one of the biggest uh, incubators in the world, one of the most important ones at least. Um, this is a really good like aim for you to get. I think but the most important thing is that you don't really want to say like, okay, well, I want to just kind of change along with my product. Um, that 5 to 7% growth is cool, but you know, I, I did a lot and I kind of like doubled my product or I made an incremental change. But you know, don't be mistaken, uh, 1x is still the same. So this is death. This is instant product death. And so what you should be thinking about constantly is not necessarily like, well, how do I iterate on this product, you know, make it a little bit better, uh, get a little bit of my percentages up. That is something you get along the way to achieving 10x growth, to really, really achieving exponential growth. So to summarize this, uh, this talk, we talked about exponential growth, about how you achieve that. And you do that through excellence, through having clear communication with your team, through uh, looking at metrics and looking at prototyping as, a, as, as clear tools to help you achieve your goals, and then combining that on an equal level with the right distribution, with the right distribution channels, preferably something that is inherent to your product, um, and aiming high with that 10x growth. I want to leave you with this statement. Um, uh, what I notice a lot is that you know, young entrepreneurs come up to me and say, well, you know, I have this idea, I don't really know if it's going to work out. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the wrong way to pitch anything to me. I will slap you in the face if you do that. Um, what, the right way to pitch is to say, I have this vision of how the future works. I have this unicorn, it's in my head. So you want to talk about that unicorn instead of the donkey that I think you, uh, you might be today. Um, if I can help with that, if I can help you make a unicorn, please, uh, please come up to me and, uh, or send me an email um, as well. Thank you. <laughs>